Hey everyone, it's Mr. Veve, and this lesson is on regulation and homeostasis. So let's get right into it with our first key concept. Systems interact to maintain homeostasis. Now that's all the organ systems in the body. So first let's talk about what homeostasis is. That is the process of maintaining a stable internal environment within the human body. So things like regulating body temperature happen here. When your body gets too cold, you'll shiver. When you get too hot, you'll sweat. So we want to make sure that we maintain that internal environment. There's a lot of different processes that take place in order to make this happen. So let's talk about communication here. So organ systems have to communicate with each other to work together to maintain this internal environment. And what they have to do when they communicate is provide feedback to each other. That way they know what to do and when to do it. So how does this communication work? Well, first we look at our nervous system here. The brain, which is sending signals through all the different nerves to the different parts of your body and the different organs. So we need that portion of your body working really well. We need it working in conjunction with your endocrine system, which is a series of glands that are throughout your body and they secrete hormones, which are our chemical messengers. So hormones go throughout the body and act on different target organs and tissues in order to elicit a response of some kind. So let's talk about feedback loops and how these affect homeostasis. So first, a positive feedback loop, just so you know, is when you have the output that enhances the stimulus. This means an increase in one thing causes an increase in another. An example here is blood clotting or the process of childbirth. Now really, the example I have in the graphic over on the left talks about an account balance in a bank that earns interest. So positive feedback means as the account balance grows, you get more interest. And as you get more interest, your account balance grows, which in turn causes more interest. So you see one increases and the other increases along with that. Positive feedback. Now there is also a negative feedback loop. That's when the output reduces the effect of the stimulus. So it's trying to return the conditions back to those ideal ranges. Now these are the ones that are really interesting what we're gonna talk about further. That's thermoregulation, the regulation of body temperature, uh, the regulation of blood glucose, and osmolarity. Now all negative feedback loops have this distinctive figure eight shape, and I'll show you a graphic that uh, explains that a little bit better. So let's first talk about thermoregulation. This one's pretty easy. The ideal temperature for the human body is about 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius, and there's a little bit of room for variation within there. Uh, you get too hot, you have a fever, you get too cold, it, it causes uh, all sorts of problems. So what happens with thermoregulation? Well, the thermoregulatory center in the brain is in the hypothalamus. So what happens is you have thermoreceptors that detect blood temperature in that part of the brain, and there's also thermoreceptors on your skin that detect that external temperature. And there's all sorts of responses that can take place because of this. So what can happen is you can have your circulatory system work here where blood vessels will dilate if you get too hot and blood vessels will constrict when you get too cold to keep some of that heat in your body. Um, the muscular system will work here because when you uh, get too cold, you will start to shiver. This uh, actively increases the temperature uh, in your body. Also, the integumentary system is at work here because when you get too hot, you will produce sweat glands and that sweat will evaporate, which cools you down. So now let's talk about blood glucose. So glucose, we know, is a product of uh, cellular respiration. That's how cells make ATP or energy. Now, there's a range here which is considered okay and, and you can see right there in the graphic, um, normally we think if, if blood glucose uh, levels go below 70, that is less than ideal. Um, over 240 is, is way higher than what's ideal. Generally, you want to be in this like 80 to 120 range um, unless you have some other condition. So if we uh, look at what happens when your blood glucose levels get too low, um, you get hungry, you get headache, you get confused, you can even start sweating, get dizzy, um, and feel generally very, very weak. Uh, when your blood glucose levels get really high, uh, you get really thirsty. This, this can also make you dizzy, but uh, also can make you feel sick to your stomach and, and things like that. Just kind of a general bad feeling rather than a confused feeling. So here's an example of that feedback loop that looks like a figure eight. So you see here, when you have uh, blood glucose levels getting higher, your pancreas will secrete insulin, 
which then lowers your blood glucose levels. But when they get too low, your insulin, uh, uh, your insulin levels go down and your pancreas uh, secretes glucagon, which helps raise those levels back up. And so the systems involved in blood glucose regulation are the nervous system, which has to detect everything, the endocrine system, which helps secrete those hormones, um, uh, insulin and glucagon, the circulatory system delivers those hormones, and the digestive system, well, that's where we can actually store some excess glucose or put it back into play, like in your liver and places like that. So last thing here is osmolarity. That is how much solute uh, there is within all of the uh, systems of your body that have water as well. So uh, we need to maintain a certain water level in order to stay healthy, right? Human body has uh, is about 75% water in your brain, 92% of your blood is water, uh, even 22% of your bones is water as well. So we need to make sure we keep that healthy balance of water. Now you guys remember uh, from uh, knowing different types of solutions, hyper and hypotonic and isotonic, in the blood, isotonic is best. That's when the solute concentration inside and outside the cell is the same. Hypotonic solutions will make the blood cells uh, rupture and hypertonic will make them shrivel up. It's kind of a little review there. So here is all the systems involved in osmolarity. Obviously we need the nervous system to detect things, the endocrine system to secrete those hormones, circulatory system to take the hormones different places, uh, and then we have the integumentary system which is uh, has those sweat glands, excretory is where you have your kidneys excreting urine. Now here's another feedback loop, the negative feedback loop that has the figure eight shape, just so you can see. So if you start off in the middle there with your water content being normal, if you lose too much salt because of sweating, uh, your water content in your blood gets low, your brain produces a hormone, um, then that goes and acts on your kidney, which tells it to reabsorb more water, and then you pee less. That's the basic idea of that. So just make sure you look at uh, this, this uh, whole chart here just so you can kind of better understand how these systems work.